There is a sense that you can uncover more and more and more of the, let's say, depths of truth hidden within a certain, uh, let's say, the Godzilla idea. You can right. uncover more. So you don't need to subvert. You can actually plumb deeper. That's, right. I think, the way that you have that. That's the way that you do it that lasts through time. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the goons to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. I'm Mark Joba, and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Byrne coming to you from Tbilisi, Georgia. And today we have another of our Anadromist Dialogue episodes, and we are honored to have with us uh, Justin Wells, uh, and uh, he works in the film industry in Los Angeles, Southern California, Hollywood, um, and uh, works doing camera work and other things uh, there, and we had uh, a very interesting discussion about the state of the film industry, the state of the entertainment media in general, and I think you're going to find this really fascinating, so we'll get along with that in just a moment. First of all, on the 31st evening uh, to be Lisi time, 10 o'clock in the evening to midnight, we are going to have a live uh, broadcast. Is this broadcasting? Um, uh, which will be a combination of giving uh, people a chance to come in and talk. Um, and also, if you have a video, you can submit it to reckoningmotions at yahoo.com. I, I've only gotten a couple so far. I would like a few more if you'd like to give a New Year's uh, salutation or hope or fear or whatever. What was your 2023 like? What do you hope for 2024? Just a few minutes of that. Uh, I'm also going to continue fundraising. And uh, I've, I haven't done much because, you know, it was Christmas time and I wanted to give myself and everyone else a chance to have a break. But... I will be resuming that again New Year's Eve, and we will be doing a countdown, and keep in mind that Tbilisi is 12 hours ahead of Los Angeles, uh, three hours ahead of Paris, uh, and you can kind of do the math in between there, although you never know, someone from Australia could get in touch with me, but uh, that's not a good time for them. They're usually asleep at 10 o'clock in the evening, my time, but... I'd be honored if any of you could stop in, put it on your calendar. I am going to put just a little message up in different places for you to find out so you have another reminder of that. And, um, yeah, so without any further ado, our anadromous dialogue with Justin Wells. <laughs> okay, I'll try it again. So uh, I've okay. got Justin Wells with me. We tried to have a conversation uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, and uh, but we tried to have a conversation a few months back, and stuff started happening, but I know we are recording now, and so we are going to talk. Uh, Justin was just explaining what he does. He lives in the Southern California area, and his connection to the film is... Yes. Uh, and um, so anyway, so so I I I like to think deeply about the archetypes um, integrating, um, you know, the the archetypal stories, the ancient stories, as well as the biblical stories, um, all of that corpus of of meaning. And I'm I'm looking to find a way to to help writers that want to incorporate all of that into their into their writing, you know, so screenwriting novels. That's my next world. But I work yeah. in in as a camera guy as my day job. Uh, I work as a camera guy on movies, and um, I do a, a lot of live performances as a camera technician, right. commercials, um, sitcoms, you name it. I've I've been working in Hollywood and working in film my entire career. I've never not had a job that wasn't related to film uh, cool. since college. 
So that's me. Well, I thought that this would be a great time of year to discuss this. This last year has been, I would say, pretty tumultuous in the film business as a whole. And I think you'd, <laughs> is there anybody who would disagree with that assessment? And I was thinking, I'm going to just go over a couple things here that just kind of a couple brief summaries of things. And then we will dive into whatever, whichever one of these seems to strike our interest. But this reminds me of, there have been two other crisis periods in film history. One was about 1929, the stock market had crashed, the Great Depression had begun, but also sound had come into the movie industry. And that was a period of great upheaval and change. Uh, it would also lead to a, a, a about a very serious censorship, which would last until the next really important year, which was 1968. It could have been 67, could have been 69, but I'm going with 68. Um, and that's when the studio system seemed to be, the, the studio system that had been controlling film production from the 1920s all the way to 1968 had really been sputtering, but that's when it really, it kind of came to, uh, there were big movie failures. Uh, there was a Julie Andrews movie called Star with an exclamation point. Box office failure, lost tons of money. They expected it to be the next Sound of Music. And in fact, put it in the same theaters as the Sound of Music. Didn't do anything. Dr. Doolittle, same thing. Rex Harrison from My Fair Lady, another huge musical hit. Didn't do anything. Uh, they owed money. And then they got uh, <laughs> two great singers, Lee Marvin and Clint Eastwood, to be in the movie <laughs> Paint Your Wagon, which was another yeah. box office flop of a musical. With if you ever, I have a copy of that. And um, if you ever watch it, it's it's funny you gotta watch how it. boring it is. <laughs> it's just like, this is a musical. And it's yeah. just like guys standing around. They call the wind. <laughs> Uh, you know. So, but also during that time, you had the, in, the 68 was the year they introduced the rating system, which was a massive change in how things were done in the movie business. And all of this was taking place at the height of the 60s, 1968 being this, this catastrophic year for uh, rioting and protests and such like that. So that was, and that year uh, you had films coming out. I think it was Bonnie and Clyde was 67. I know 68 was The Graduate. The movie that really changed everything was actually Easy Rider because it was this cheap movie, made tons of money, and and the studios, what was left of these fragmented studios, looked at that and said, um, <laughs> well, we should do something different. And that's what opened up the new Hollywood of the 1970s. And then eventually the blockbuster era, which we are now in the death throes of, I think, in some way. So let me just list you some of the things. I think 20, 19, uh, 19, 2023 will go down as one of those years of the, the, the major changes. Uh, and these seem even bigger. We're still... So I'm just going to list these, and then we can go back and discuss them. And, and if you have any comments before we start to discuss them, it, it's your turn. So we are still having a recovery from the pandemic, and especially movie theaters trying to get people back into the seats. Um, then you have Disney having a catastrophic year, losing over a billion dollars, plus other aspects of their empire kind of falling apart. Uh, their purchases of Marvel, Lucasfilm, Pixar, all racking up losses. These, these were the, you know, these three companies alone provided so much entertainment and financial, uh, a financial gold rush for the last, I don't know, uh, since, since Star Wars in the 60s. There's, there's been this huge rush of things. But losses there, uh, Warner Brothers had the DC extended universe, the DCEU, that suffered major uh, hits. And right now, Aquaman is being released. And, you know, who cares? Nobody. It's just... Um, then you have the writers and actors strike, which came right as Barbenheimer was hitting, uh, the Barbie-Oppenheimer double feature, practically. 
uh, which was really great. Everyone said, finally, the movie business is back on its feet. And then it got itself kneecapped by the writer's strike and the actor's strike, which probably had to happen because of one of the other things on the list here, uh, the streaming services started to have problems too because they were becoming too much like cable media. And um, we'll, we'll discuss that. And then you had very weird, uh, well, also... Uh, places like Target and other big box stores decided they were no longer carrying physical media. So you've got problems with every aspect of the distribution system here for movies. And some people are saying, well, maybe movies will just die. I don't think so. But um, then you have, and then, and then of course, with the writers and actors strike, that pretty much gutted a lot of the second part of the year as far as new releases. So big movies like Dune and there were others got pushed back to 2024. And then you had very weird things happening. Like you had the movie, The Sound of Freedom, which kind of came out of nowhere, was totally rejected by all the mainstream critics and yet made hundreds of millions of dollars on a teeny budget. And then uh, the, the weirdest thing of all is you have Taylor Swift's The Eras Tour, literally avoiding the entire Hollywood industry. And uh, Taylor Swift's team went up to, uh, uh, what is it, AMC, and that started a, the, the theater chain and said, hey, can we put this in? And all the big, <laughs> and Hollywood just said, okay, get everything out of the way. And literally, this is, I think, what did I see recently? It was like 400 million or uh, worldwide. So it's just very weird. It was a huge hit here in Georgia, you know, 12 yeah. hours away from uh, yeah. LA. So, so yeah. anyway, that I just, those are just some things that stuck out to me this year. It's just like, wow, what, what is going on this year? What, what, yeah. have been, how's, how's your perspective been on this stuff? Well, it's interesting. I can't say too much about the Taylor Swift thing because I was part of the production on that. Okay, um, so you, I, you saw, had to sign an NDA, didn't you? I did. I couldn't say anything when we were okay. shooting it. I um, understand. But well, but I do just, know... That's just interesting yeah. to know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I'm basically, um, you know, I work now for a lot of these multi-camera live event things. We've done, we did... The first, actually, the first uh, group to do that was actually a Korean uh, K-pop band, mm. and they were the first ones we did the, that. I think it was last year. Was it BTS in, or Blackpink or uh, BTS? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they um, they basically just paid for it themselves. You know, mm -hmm. paid the production company to shoot it. Didn't go through a studio, and then they released it. I believe they released it in Korea as right. a film. You know, yeah. so that was. You know, so it wasn't unprecedented for Taylor Swift to yeah, go well, to. It, e it even came through here briefly. Yeah. Okay. But, okay. But but uh, um, Taylor Swift did not come here through here briefly. It was mm -hmm. sold out for a month straight. I saw it over a month afterwards because I had people visiting yeah. me from out of town. And it was pretty busy through October. And I went and saw it in the beginning of November. And... The, the the theater was half full of girls dancing in the aisles and down at the front of the theater. Yeah. And it's still playing once a day to half full. Yeah. You know, this is just crazy. <laughs> yeah. The well, I should have told you that I worked on it so you could have at least seen my name on the credits when it went. Oh, by. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll eventually get I have, just because of my musical studies and such, I have to eventually get I'm sure she will put out a Blu-ray of it simply because she's really into physical stuff. And, mm -hmm. and I've often yeah. wondered how many teenage girls have bought turntables because of her, because she yeah. puts out her records and, and then she doesn't put out quite the same thing on vinyl that she does. She's, a, she's actually, people say she's a genius. Well, one thing is for sure. She's just genius at business and marketing. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That's how yeah. She that very well. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, see, for me, um, it was that, that, that really saved my year financially you know working working um with with everything on strike i wound up doing three or four big music projects like that um which was the only thing Did that you, you could work be on shooting. beyonce 
No, I didn't work on that one. No, but I did um, Amazon Music, which was a, a live musical performance after every football game every Thursday night right. during the football season, the first half of the football season. I did Taylor Swift. Um, I did, uh, yeah, it's, and some corporate things, you know. So yeah, I, yeah. I managed to yeah. survive. Well, the, pretty the Taylor Swift movie was just, I was amazed by how well it was put together. I mean, I've seen a lot of concert films in my time, and uh, it was just so i mean it, it kept you moving it didn't just focus you on one thing it was much like the concert itself is just sense around experience so well yeah we, i mean we had we had 38 cameras throughout the stadium and we shot three nights so we did the first night we did um we put the steady cam on the stage we put um the robo cam all the close-up stuff mm. which would of course ruin the the wide shots Right. Then the second night we took those off and then we did uh, one set of wide shots. I and then the, th the third night we moved them all. So there was over, over well over a hundred angles and we right. shot it all with cinema cameras, the Venice, Sony Venice, uh, full frame lenses, cinema style, like, like you would shoot a movie. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and what I thought about it was see, cause when I, I did, I had one night in the stadium where I had a high, high wide camera way, way up in the back. And they're a little tiny down there dancing. You can see them all dancing, doing their choreography down there. And that's what it's like to be in the stadium. But the energy in the stadium, of course, is, is incredible. Like all of that energy focused on one person is very, uh, you know, causes the hair on your on your arm to stand up because of all that energy, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the actual intimacy with the performer is removed because you're so far away. Most people are so far away, except for the $4,000 seats right in front or something. Right? right. So the theater experience had this very unique uh, idea was like, wow, they're getting, they're dancing in the aisles of, of the movie theater and they're getting that intimate feel with the performer because of the camera angles that we were able to get. Yeah. But they also get the fact that they're in, they're not watching it at home. Right. They're watching it at the theater. Yeah. So I thought, man, that, that probably is going to be more of that. Right. And probably right. more artists are going to realize that they can, they can do that because we, right. we know how to shoot it that way now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that struck me about all of this stuff happening this year is this isn't all bad news. Some of this is very good news, uh, you know, that something can come out of left field like Sound of Freedom or, uh, Taylor Swift's Eras tour and just kind of come sweep in and take up the space, you know, take up what would have been blockbuster space. But the blockbusters seem so, not all of them, but many of them seem quite pathetic, <laughs> you know, just uh, absence of story, too much messaging. Uh, it's like they forgot how to make movies or something. And, mm -hmm. uh, but, but, yeah. Then, and also, I think just as, you know, in 1929, everything just seemed primitive again, film-wise. They had really brought the silent film up art up to a high level because the camera was really mobile and moving around. And it took them a while to get out of the, you know, the sound equipment and sets that they were stage-bound by, you know, so that they could start moving the camera and um, making it interesting. And, and eventually you start hitting the golden age of the studio system. And in this uh, 1968, eventually, again, you hit the kind of golden age of the new Hollywood era, you know, um, and, you know, whatever else you think of the 80s, 90s and on from there. But and I think uh, this is actually a time when there it's like the, the uh, everything's being shuffled around a bit. And so this is a time for people with new ideas, I think, to have those ideas and uh try to implement them. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing to me always is because I've now attended the Sundance Film Festival about 20 years. Mm. I didn't go this last year because it would conflicted with my class. But I over the years, that's been an, a real gauge to see kind of like where the uh, not not the business types, the marketing types right. that 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 do the, the the Hollywood industrial complex, like the mainstream world, but more the artist types who are kind of like the canaries in the coal mine. They either can, sm they can smell if something foul is in the culture a little sooner. And so they're often dealing with the emotions of whatever it is that's going on in the, in the culture two or three years prior. 
Right. So it's a good gauge of that. And um, this year at Sundance, uh, what we were seeing were were um, meaning crisis films. Mm -hmm. And and that's that is what I think is the culture is going through. Yeah. Uh, And and they're going to come out on the other side eventually. But right now it's going through. Imagine if you're a kid growing up. And you've never seen a straightforward story. You've only seen invert, you know, alternate takes, inverted takes, um, you know, uh, twi- uh, like open ending, uh, you know, like the boy, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, and they never get back together. <laughs> you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. only those kinds of stories, only postmodern stories, you might say, only right. stories that are inversions or variations. So what 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 are you going to do with your life? You're going to say, well, I don't know what any of this means. So if you look at, for example, Asteroid City, the end of right. Asteroid City, um, I, oh, I, can I spoil things? Is that okay? I Should we? Yeah. I'm, okay. So in Asteroid you, City, spoiling is great. I, I've seen <laughs> some of my favorite okay. Okay. films having them spoiled ahead of time. So all right, everybody just realize that if I mention a movie, I'm going to spoil it. <laughs> Just stop before if stop yeah, I've before never you're right. I've never been one to squeal about that, but some people might okay. be. So oh sure, sure. Yeah. Um okay, so so in Asteroid City, it's of course meta because right. you find out that That's this true. has been a play. You know, you think it's a, about a alien showing up in a city, asteroid city, and these people trying to deal it, then you find out, oh, wait a minute. Now we're watching a a play about that, what we all were watching. And um, and one of the characters says to the writer, or he thinks it's the right or whatever. He goes, I don't understand all this. What does it all mean? And what does the guy say? He goes, it doesn't mean anything. Just do it. Right. <laughs> Just say your lines. Yeah. You know? Right. And that's very much sort of the Wes Anderson, that sort of postmodern world right. of all expression but no meaning. If you think of two the two sides, meaning and expression. Yeah. All style, but no point, you know? And so now people are starting to think, like, think of the younger generation, and they're going, uh, what does it all mean? Like, what path should I take in life? If you look, there's a one a movie called Past Lives. Did you mm-hmm. see that? Uh, uh, no, uh, I don't watch. I watch streaming services like one month a year. And, okay. and that was supposed to be this month. But I had some weird shenanigans with my bank account in Alaska where someone actually got my card number and made some purchases. So they canceled it. Okay. And it's taking okay. a month for my card to get here. So I'll oh, have okay. on the 29th and I'm counting the days. I do have a local bank account and I've got some spare money lying around, but it's like, everything's tight. Just like, wait, don't start anything new. And then I'll watch some of that to catch up. On okay. Some of well, can, can I spoil it for you? Yeah, I, sure. I, yeah, yeah I've, I've heard people remember. talk about it. It sounds really fascinating. So it, well, past lives, it's like, okay, the, the two childhood friends, a boy and a girl. Right. Yeah. And then it's, it's sort of like they take different paths and they meet back up together and it, it's, a, it's, again, this sort of thing of like, um, they they don't know, what was the line from it? Um, it's about, you know, fate, and but you don't know who you are. So the, so the woman changes her name, and that's why the, the, the boyhood crush can't find her later. But then by the time he does find her, it's too late because she's married to somebody else. And so there's this whole sense of like playing with the idea of meaning and fate, purpose, destiny. And not finding the meaning, purpose, and destiny, or not knowing if that meaning, purpose, and destiny is good. And so it's kind of a a natural consequence of saying, you can be, you know, the paradox of choice. You can be whoever you want. You can be whoever you want. But what's the consequence of that is is all of the, you're unable to commit to any one path. And so you're constantly jumping from path to path to path to path. And so all the characters are crying at the end of the movie. And you're like, well, why are they crying? Well, they're lamenting the fact that they never went down that path and they'll never know what that path would have yielded to them if they would have committed to it. Mm. But they jump to this one because they're because they 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 just aren't sure. Is right. that the right? Is that this the right path? Similar to Asteroid City. It's like, right. well, what you know, I'm saying the lines a bit, but I don't even know, like at least in the past, like you could say. Well, you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that. And you could deal with the fact that, well, maybe I didn't live up to that or something. But now you're being told you're not supposed to do anything. And so now it's this weird sense of the younger generation of Mm -hmm. just. Uh Uh-oh, frozen again. 
We and you just froze for about three minutes there. Two minutes. Oh, oh, really? Oh, shoot. Yeah. So go back to the end of you. You. you we got the end of past lives. Everybody crying, and then start over again. Okay. So so there's a movie called um, Stonewalling. Okay. And Stonewalling is about a, a girl who becomes pregnant. And if you if you go and watch um, a uh, like the interview with the director, it's a husband and wife directing team. It's very illuminating. You know, they basically said that she they had written the screenplay and it's just a, a little minimalist film about a woman who's single, who's pregnant. And it's going through the stages of pregnancy and she's thinking about the future. And of course, it's the the, the big meaning crisis thing is, should I bring new life into this world? You know, right. that's always the question. Should we, should we, what, what do we think about the future? And um, the director actually says, you know, in the interview, she said, once we cast the film and once I started hanging out with the younger girls, the 20 somethings, um, I realized that they've got this, this feeling of not knowing what to do, not knowing what to do with pregnancy right. in a metaphorical sense what to birth into the future, you know? Right. And so it's all of this kind of anxiety over that that's going on. All of this kind of like, I just think it's just meaning, you know, processing yeah. through the meaning crisis yeah. and processing through the paradox of choice, which is that if you choose one uh, path, if you don't know what path to go on, you'll never yeah. know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And people today have little confidence in pretty much anything. You know, uh, they don't yes. know what to believe. I mean, I saw the movie Exorcist Believer, which, you know, uh, and and there wasn't much believing going on, <laughs> you know, it was and the Roman Catholics really didn't do much in there. Uh, some demon comes in by uh, by way of a voodoo ritual. And they they bring. OK, imagine these two people in the same room, two people in the same room holding hands with some other kind of nebulous people one a pentecostal preacher and the other a voodoo practitioner all trying to get rid of the demons and the girl and they end up you know but i'm sitting there going i, I can't think of a day that ends in why uh that that where a, a pentecostal preacher is going to spend five minutes in a room with a voodoo practitioner trying to get a demon out of someone and it's just so it was ridiculous so i, I actually made a video on it because it was i have a new channel called the anadrome which is more for uh, just more punchy uh, arts, media, music kind of stuff. Um, but I was there was a movie. I just I'm, I'm catching up a little bit on horror films, and I have some Blu-rays that I picked up. I'm I'm still in the land of physical media, and uh, I was so I had heard that this recent Dracula film called The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Uh, was interesting. And the re what set me off to, to get it was one of the critics that I watch regularly on YouTube said, well, you know, it's not a bad movie. It's just a really straight ahead story, but there's no real twist on it. It's just like, uh, you know, that the section out of the movie, uh, uh, out of the book Dracula, where they're on the ship and it's the captain's log and all of that. And I looked at the images, I go, oh, no, that looks really fascinating. And it was. It was a solid movie. It wasn't the greatest movie ever, but it was a solid story. And and the 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 lead character, he's on a quest to find out whether there is any meaning in the world. And and he so he then meets evil incarnate uh, as as uh, this rather Nosferatu looking uh, vampire is. Uh, you know, killing everyone and eventually looks him in the face, you know, and, and he has this interesting speech uh, at the end. And, and then he's saved by one of this woman who had been bitten by, had been a, a slave of the vampire, but she saves him before she turns back into a vampire and ends up burning in the sun. There, spoiled the whole movie. And she, he gives a speech at the end saying, I have seen that there is real evil and I've seen that there is real good. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, and I thought that was an interesting, you know, uh, movie yeah. and it was quite well produced and it was, you know, the acting was pretty good. I mean, you can quibble with parts of it. And like I said, it's not going to be the top of the line, but, 
But I think there are, I think we'll be seeing more films that are trying, you, you, what you're saying is right. You, uh, you know, if you're a, a young millennial or a Zoomer or heaven knows alpha, all you've been seeing are the postmodern takes, you know, what Jonathan Peugeot calls the what, parasitical storytelling. You've mm -hmm. seen those versions, but you haven't seen, you don't know the real stories. You don't, you know. Now, what's weird is 20 years ago, all younger kids had very solid versions of, say, Lord of the Rings. They had some decent films which really told a straight-ahead story. But those all got inverted along the way, along with, you know, the superheroes went from being, you know, the Christopher Nolan Batman was dark and brooding. But they told a pretty straight-ahead story, if questioning. But by the time you get to the the craziness of uh, the Marvel MCU or who knows what was happening with the DCU or whatever it is, by the time you get there, the jokiness and postmodern and this, the meta-ness of it starts to take over so that, and, and that's deeply dissatisfying, <laughs> you know, so that when Top Gun Maverick came out, it was a huge success because everyone said, oh, this is just a normal story. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, you know, um, yeah, Tom Cruise is a perfect example because he has enough, you know, he's just a big star Yeah, and he had, so he can do whatever he wants. And so he's like, I'm just going to do my thing, you know, and it works. And people are like, oh, I like that, you know. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think I think that's going to happen. I mean, imagine if you've never seen any Disney um, fairy tale, you didn't see Snow White, you didn't see Sleeping Beauty, and and then you watch Shrek, completely right. old. That You're not going to get any references. references. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, the whole point of the 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 inverted or the or the twist or the you know is to comment to be a commentary on the original. Right. But if you don't know the original, <laughs> right, right. Then it's going to seem like everything is total chaos. Yeah, Shrek yeah. does have meaning, right? But it only has meaning in relation to the stories that it's making fun of. Right. 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 Well, you'd often hear this word subversive that it's yeah. oh this was really a, it was a good subversive take on this fairy tale this was a good subversive take on the superhero this was a good mm -hmm. subversive take on this fantasy or or sci-fi film or something like that but after a while it's, it's exactly what you're saying mm -hmm. it doesn't do any good to do the subversive take if no one knows the actual version yeah because and of course we know you know, people love to talk about tropes and all of these different cliches and things. But the truth is, uh, people today probably understand the, as far as uh, visual media goes, probably understand less of the past than ever before. You know, and something happened. Um, you're, you're, are you old, uh, are you Gen X or old millennial? Uh well, I was born in 70, 77. So I, that's, so I'm in my forties. I don't, I don't know if that. Yeah. That's where the, something like you're right on the cusp of the two. But yeah. uh, when I was younger, one of the things that's missing is we do not share media anymore. And so what, what I mean by that is it used to be all the way up until, I mean, the, the end of it was probably game of Thrones, but all the way up until uh, you, when you had, only a few channels and a few cable, uh, special cable shows that really showed movies. But then they had to fill up time, so they showed a lot of older movies on different channels. Um, I mean, when I grew up, you had three channels and PBS and maybe a few local, one or two local channels in the San Francisco Bay Area. So everything that you got that way came to you, handed on a platter, you know, uh, that's what you saw. Having that shared media meant that we all kind of were watching the same things. We could all refer to the same things. When I grew up, you knew that so-and-so would be on television at a certain time. And many people saw that thing, you know, or that a, a big movie would come to town and everyone would go see it. And I think Game of Thrones was near the end of that. Uh, it was kind of already sputtering out because of the proliferation of streaming services and, uh, various ways of watching films and such but 
you know, that was one of the last things that people gathered, you know, water cooler uh, type moments where people gathered and talked about what did you think happens and such. Is there anything that people do that with now anymore? I mean, <laughs> did Game no, of it, Thrones so burn them out with its ending that it just, you know, uh, you know, did anyone? It's only, it yeah, it's, it has to be niche. You know, it has to be like, I've learned, see, I didn't know this, but there's a whole subculture called Swifties. Oh, yeah. Since yeah. Involved with that and they all they all follow each other on social media and they all yeah. so there is there the, those things do exist but they're well i just not yeah i had to catch up with that myself i just uh wrote uh i once i realized that this movie was coming out and i started reading about it and, and i knew enough about taylor swift to say okay i better go watch this movie because this seems to be an important touchstone which i think it really is and um, but also I had to catch up, you know, musically. But then I started going into Swifty World on YouTube and stuff. And I said, oh, my, there's a lot going on here. And uh, what was really interesting, well, what I did was I wrote uh, a fairly good size essay of, on it that I put on my uh, on, on Taylor Swift. I call, just simply called Who is Taylor Swift that I put on my Substack. And now I'm just finishing up a second one which is called Taylor Swift, Goddess, Witch, or Christian. <laughs> and uh, because she gets accused of being like, you know, part of the Illuminati. But then again, when you watch the relationship of her to her audience, it's like, what's going on here? And then at the same time, sometimes she acts like she's not a Christian at all. Other times she does. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to unparse uh, parse this out, so, you know, saying, okay, where, whoa, what's going on here? And she has so much power over so much, actually, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and especially, of course, the Swifties. But um, but yeah, I've I've had to, you know, but again, that's really a niche kind of thing. I've had to yeah. really. Um, uh, I mean, well, actually, she's become one of the few things that isn't. It's jumped out of the box as the second half of the year. So. Okay, I've lost you again. It's nice to see this, though. Yeah, but she's ended up becoming something now everyone's talking about, which mm -hmm. is really fascinating how that happened. And her movie changes the rules of the game. So uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's become something that I don't think anyone in Hollywood a year ago saw coming from left field. You know, just like, ooh, Taylor Swift's arriving. And changes the entire way films are distributed you know yeah i think something like that has happened also the sound of freedom stuff has also changed the way films are distributed and i think the daily wire is trying to do that as well they've had some minor hits and such but but i think what it is is we're seeing this moment where people are trying to figure this new thing out because i think quite clearly interestingly enough netflix is they created this model for streaming, which is when you get down to it, really bizarre. And they also have a very definite stated goal of eliminating physical media. And I've seen a lot of people discussing this. I'm a big uh, like Blu-ray DVD person and such. And I've seen a lot of people discussing a few, well, a very few people have said, well, maybe I should just stop collecting. But then uh, what, uh, more people are saying is no it's becoming niche it's just something that it'll go back it, there was a heyday when everyone was collecting these things and that was like maybe 10 15 years ago it'll go back to being a, a niche thing that is just on the side yeah well i think it, it, the what's underneath all of this like what i see it as is it of course there's trends and there's people who follow trends Right. But those are like waves and they they eventually die out, you know, but underneath that is is value. And right. and those that's what creates the waves at any one given point, you know. So, you know, it just everything what I've learned over the years, if I've learned anything, is that if it's a value, it will come back in style eventually, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the sitcom is is down right now. You know, yeah. I'm working on sitcom right now. It's one of like five sitcoms that are even yeah. exist. You know? And it's a form though that works. If 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 you want comedy, 
in front of an audience, easily, quickly shot on stage with like mm -hmm. a play with the four cameras. All it was going to take is one sitcom to capture, capture the imagination and trend. Right. And then all of a sudden you're going to see 50 sitcoms being made, you know? So th that's the kind of stuff that like, what I think is if you're, if you work in Hollywood or if you want to be a writer, if you want to be an artist, you got to look for the value underneath that mm -hmm. and find one that's, that you can do. And th this is, I think Taylor Swift is a good example because she has a song. Basically what she said was, I just, whenever I have, I have an emotion or feeling, I write a song about it. Right. So her whole uh, set of albums is a kaleidoscope of female emotions, right. young female emotions for every single situation. She has a song about how to feel about that. And that's why when I was in that stadium with 80,000 screaming women, there were so many, <laughs> there's so many girls that they papered over the men's restrooms and put women's. And I had to go down and outside to the outhouses to, to go to the bathroom. Look for a you know? wall. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know what? Just, just mapping human emotions in this situation, this situation is something that people really appreciate and value. Right. And it's like, you know, it, that, it, it, that's something, that's the value that she found underneath the trends. And now all of a sudden she's trending. Right. Possibly because of timing, possibly because of good business acumen from her right. family, this and this, but you know, it's well, not like. <laughs> one thing that's interesting about her is, is she makes a, uh, a point of saying, I'm not cool. And that is to mm -hmm. say, uh, she has done some very ironic kind of songs, but they're, and, and some of them could be classified as postmodern. But the point is, she makes a big deal out of having emotions and making it all right to have emotions, where if you think back, say, 10, 15 years, the whole point was not to, was to mm -hmm. act like you didn't, you know, especially yeah. among the youth, you know, it's to kind of feel like, yeah, you know, it's just like, it's not affecting me, whatever. Whereas she's made it cool, too. And I see that as a bellwether for uh, the we're moving into a new zone. Mm -hmm. And that zone will include people seriously looking for meaning. I just I didn't watch it yet. But I, somewhere I think on on unheard Paul Kings North uh, had something where he's just basically said, you know, God's back on the table and we're moving into those times. You know, yep. well, how so? Well, that's a, a different subject. Mm -hmm. But I think yep. we are. I I think the uh, the woke religion is losing its steam. It's not going to go away. It's going to go away and morph and come back with a very different kind of transhumanist agenda at some point. But I think that that we're we're in this time of uh, it's a fluid time. It's not set in stone, which can make everyone feel very nervous. But it's also a time when things happen. That's why the seventies coming right after the 60s and of course in the movie business it always takes a few years for what happens in the culture to kind of move over into the movie business because you know it takes longer to make a movie so yeah i mean there do you remember there's a song and and, and my dad used to sing it because he thought it was so funny of his generation right and it was about the 80s and it and the song goes First I was a hippie, then I was a stockbroker, now I am a hippie again. <laughs> no, I don't remember that one. You, you, you don't know up. who did that, who sang that? No, my dad always sings it, you know, because he thought well, it was so funny, I, indicative of the 80s. With first, this little bit of information, I can find it. Okay, okay. So first yeah, you're a hippie, yeah. yeah. you know, first, first you're like, yeah, let's subvert, let's rebel against the previous generation let's wear our hair long when we're supposed to wear it short let's right. you know this right and then you get to the 80s and it's like well i need to make money so i'm going to be a stockbroker but then once you have the money you're like well now i'm going to go back to being a hippie because now right. <laughs> you know that's that's cool so right. first i was a hippie then i was a stockbroker now i am a hippie again <laughs> <laughs> okay there you go well that does say something though uh, although what will today's generation say when they get older, you know, first I was, yeah, a, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 today's generation might say, you know, first I was a, what do they, what do they say? An activist. First I was right. an active, then I was a stockbroker. Now I'm an activist again. You know, it might be something like that, you know, like right. the, uh, yeah. the, this generation's 
subversive kind of like we're gonna uh this is this is what we think is meaningful but it's a a a, a uh a tearing down of the old structure right but you can't right. you can't live off of that so you have to go be a stockbroker like in the 80s for a while and right. then you can go back to the fashionable cool thing you know something like that's going on i think yeah yeah well i noticed that the gen x generation is probably the most uh i don't want to say depressive most like they they just it's like this is the generation that produced like Kurt Cobain and produced uh, grunge music, a lot of hardcore punk and all this stuff, and they're the ones who are kind of like, yeah, it was never our time. It was our time for about five minutes, and then the they found the teen teenagers again, and then they started this whole new teen culture at the end of the nineties. And uh, yeah. but, in sync, in sync, and Britney Spears and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually have a song that was created by some girls called I'm Afraid of Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera. And it was done kind of as a power pop song. So, but it was, yeah, younger girls though, but still it was kind of funny. No, no, I just say, you know, I actually did think it was a great year for movies. Um, what did one you like movie this year? That, uh, Godzilla. Ah, I, see, I really wanted see to see that. And it was oh. here at the IMAX theater in English with English yeah. subtitles at 10 30 at night and the the uh, metro stops at midnight and I'm going like mm. ah, and all the buses I'm going like oh I can't go see it because <laughs> oh, it's on the edge of town at this uh big uh shopping center shopping mall so oh, well that was just, and I, I, I really don't know wanted to see it. it looked so good everyone was saying you know 15 yeah. million dollars they made it look like a hundred million or 200 million it was my favorite Godzilla movie I've ever seen. You know, I mean, it, it was just every single part that you, everything that you want out of a Godzilla movie, it had. Right. But it also had the depth, right. the philosophical depth to it. And it had a satisfying ending. And I just, I just left the theater. I said, that is the best movie I have seen in a long time. Yeah. I was really impressed. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is it took the Japanese to come in slam dunk that thing whereas yeah. you know did you, you you're obviously aware of how much money they spent on something like indiana jones five you know it's like yeah. really right. 300 million and counting and yeah. maybe much more than that and and what did you get out of it <laughs> you know yeah. just old tired stuff um well i think it shows the real lesson there is that um they just basically went and told the the perfect essence of the Godzilla movie. They right. didn't try to do their take on it. They didn't try to subvert it. They didn't try to. They just went and told this is this is the Godzilla myth, and and they just even plumbed it even more. You know, really kind of made the connection between the wartime years in Japan, the anxiety over the bomb, you right. know, and and everything that the the monster represents. Um, whereas in, in, you know, the, in, in these Indiana Jones and the Star Wars remakes and stuff like that, they're thinking, well, we can't just tell the same one that we, you know, we can't just tell Indiana Jones again. Right. So we got to right. do something to it. Well, this is, this is really the key that I think I've been recently uncovering, which is obviously you can't just retell the same story over and over, but you can repeat variations on a pattern like you would in a symphony. So think of a symphony. Let's say you have a franchise like a star wars franchise or a marvel universe or this or that right or the or which i i wish they would have had continued the monster universe that they did with the the king kong movies mm. something like that and everyone says well it gets stale right it gets stale so we got to subvert it but my point is you don't have to subvert in order for it to be fresh no think of a symphony a symphony will establish a theme Right. Then it'll do variation on it. Then it'll do another variation on it. Then it'll do another. Then it'll do a conclusion. So this is what, like in the Old Testament, you'll say, well, what's the story of, let's say, you know, Adam and David, you know? Well, those aren't the same stories, but they're the same pattern, you know? So so there, so there a, is a sense that you can uncover more and more and more of the, let's say, depths of truth hidden within a certain... Uh, let's say the Godzilla idea, 
you can uncover more. So you don't need to subvert. You can actually plumb deeper. That's, I think, the way that you have that. That's the way that you do it that lasts through time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, my favorite, I, I really like horror films. My favorite horror film of the year was Evil Dead Rise. And it is, I mean, bloody as hell, but it is, I think, the best one. Personally, I think it's the best one. Other people would say, of course not. And they would all argue about which one. But the whole point is that series has gone on and on and on and kept delivering ba variations on the same theme. And everyone will now agree who's in the horror world that out of all the different franchises, it's the one that just never made a misstep, you know, it, because mm -hmm. it, it found new ways to do the same thing. Sometimes it would veer off, but it was, there was always a kind of a central vision to it. Now that's horror. So, but I think you can see something like the mission impossible uh, franchise has done quite a good mm -hmm. job. I mean, there's, a, uh, yeah. I think the second one by John Wu is a bit of a, it's not not the best, but but basically they kept developing characters, and uh, th this one didn't do quite what they expected because Barbenheimer came the next week and sucked up all the oxygen in the room. But mm -hmm. this one has a second half. I just watched it again. I said, oh, "Okay, I see what they're doing here." You know, I thought this character died. Maybe they did. Maybe not. We'll see. There was obviously something else going on here. I think the next one next year will be a good conclusion to this year, but this year's got uh, sucked. The oxygen got sucked out of the room by Barbenheimer. So yes, and the Barbie well, that... movie was quite an uh, oh, yes. uh, as a thing. And here's what I see: I see at the beginning of the year we had Megan, which is this doll movie. But it's an AI movie, which happened to hit two things at once. One, this doll thing, which we'll come back to in a second. And the second thing is, it hit the AI thing on a perfect year for hitting AI. Then mm -hmm. you come to Barbie, which is also a movie about dolls. Both of these have done very well. And then somehow related, and I haven't quite figured out how, is the Taylor Swift movie. That is to say, I'm looking at these things, I'm going, there is a through line here, and I, I just have to see it. And then the last one, which hasn't really gone into wide release yet, but it seems to be the dark, another dark side of these themes, is Poor Things, which is also about uh, a, a created woman uh, who is okay. basically a Frankenstein woman. And I'm looking at these yeah. and going, like, this is really interesting that this pattern showed up this year. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you must have some interesting thoughts about Barbie with your with your puppetry. Oh, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Well, I did a whole thing on the relationship to dolls and Barbie. And I pointed out there's there's an introduction where they're doing the uh, the Stanley Kubrick Dawn of Time thing. And yeah. it says, you know, in the beginning, girls always played with baby dolls. And I immediately went, no, nope. <laughs> baby dolls are just a Victorian thing. Before that, they played with full size yeah. human dolls and families for the most part, whole families of dolls. And that goes back into time. It's always been, you know, a family. Maybe there might be a baby or something. But, but yeah, yeah. I uh, I do find it interesting. And I have personally myself, um, shall we say, reconfigured some Barbies for puppet shows. <laughs> right. So, uh, right. um, without going into too much detail about how bloody an affair it was, but uh, but no, I thought I thought that was a fascinating film for this year, and. And like Paul Vanderclay said, uh, this wasn't a film made for me. You know, it, it's just like it's it's very clear. And, you know, I could kind of dismiss any kind of virtue signaling in this film because I said, well, that's the film. You know, the film is yeah. this thing. But it, it for some reason doesn't hit you over the head in the same way some clunky uh, Ms. Marvel kind of thing would do. You know, it yeah. it doesn't. Uh, Captain Marvel, Miss Marvel, whatever. Um, it, you know, it doesn't yeah. hit you in the same way as as a woke Disney product does, because it's honest about what it's doing. Well, and yes, you've got the no, whole no Ken thing going. Yeah, so the what? So you've got the Ken thing going on, which is was a really interesting. Yes. I think uh, Ryan Gosling did an amazing job with that mm. part because I think he added things that just, I mean it. He added things that I don't think Greta Gerwig knew were there. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, I think Noah Baumbach and Greta Gerwig as a couple, mm -hmm. they're, you know, Noah Baumbach was an independent um, yeah. New York filmmaker for years and years. He's a kind right. of more of a Woody Allen type, squid in the whale, right. family dramas set in New York. You know, that's right. who he is. And so he co-wrote the screenplay. And so he's an influence there as well. And what I see with these movies is everybody is trying to figure out what to do next. Right. You know, after everything's been destroyed, let's say, you know, mm -hmm. this is this is a movie for mothers to say, OK, I know what my mother taught me to do. And right. I've questioned that. And my mother questioned what her mother taught her. So if you go back two generations, right, to the beginning of Barbie, you know, um, now I've got a daughter. That's the America Ferrera character. Right. What do I do? What do I teach her? And there's a real question. There's a huge question mark there right. for everybody. And it's also on the on the male side, too, with the Ken idea. Well, right. what do we teach our sons? Right. What do we teach our sons? What do we teach our daughters? It's this sense of we don't know where to go. Like I was saying earlier, you know, we don't know which path to take. We've deconstructed everything. And so that's what the movies are really wrestling with, I think. But right. I think that's actually the right question to be asking. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah. we should want to know what to teach our daughters and we yeah. should want to know what to teach our sons. It, and yes. And, and if your parents taught you to subvert all expectations, mm -hmm. <laughs> what's left for you to teach your children? Right, exactly. You know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I think there's that sense. I think the the best films of the year have had either a sense of okay, now what do we do, or uh, in some cases, a pointing down the road saying this way, maybe you know that kind of thing. Although yes. I, we're not going to get out of uh, this, we're kind of we've been in this zone. I think since the 80s, particularly by the end of the 80s, we arrived in the zone where you had blockbusters versus indies. But mm -hmm. then when, when Netflix came in and then you had Disney Plus and all these streaming services, all of that got to totally confused. And then you throw in the pandemic and you have films that uh, there, there was a movie uh, I saw called Love and Monsters, nice uh, kind of sci-fi monster movie should have been a big release, but it was released during the pandemic. So, you know, who saw it? Uh, but, but you have these films and it, and it had a theme about where do we go from here? And do you know what film I really am curious to see what it's going to do is the new film called civil war. Do you know? Oh, really? That? Okay. Yeah. It's coming no, out. I don't know. I and Oh, I'm trying to remember who directed it. It's not like a, a nobody. It's got serious actors, and it's about a, a new civil war in America. Hmm. And I think that uh, the, who directed it will probably come back to me in a moment. I just found out about this a couple of days ago and saw the trailer for it. But um, I think, you know, obviously that film was made to prevent, you know, that by showing us, uh, you know, what would happen if in some sort of way. And, of course, hmm. it will be picked to pieces politically by, you know, every different side for saying this or that. But you see, to me, part of the hope of this period is that one of the things that happened as people started to question the more oppressive nature of some of the woke narrative is, and some of the more extreme right-wing kind of uh, responses is you start to get a large circle in the middle. And I often say it's, it's people who are arguing, who were in the culture war against each other in the 90s you know, uh, mm -hmm. who are suddenly finding themselves on the same place saying, wait a minute, we want to live in the real world here. We want mm -hmm. to have real conversations. You know, if we disagree with someone, that's fine. You know, we want, yeah. we want you know, don't take this away from us in the name of some sort of purity, you know, some mm -hmm. sort of identity struggle or something. And, yeah. uh, and I think that's what, I think there is a real hunger among the younger people for something real which is why they also fall prey to the things that aren't real because mm -hmm. you know, they don't know where to look. Yes, know? exactly. Yeah. Now I want to mention one documentary since I'm a documentary guy. Let me, let me look it up here. Okay. Do you remember Steve, Steve McQueen directed a movie called 12 years a slave? Yeah. I about, saw. Uh, um, uh, what was it? 
let me just look him up here. Um, he did a movie a, a set in Amsterdam, right? Um, and it's called oh, it's called Occupied City. Okay. Um, so Steve McQueen, he's British. He's yeah. he's African of African yeah. descent. He's British, and he teamed up with a a Jewish. I think she's um, Scandinavian mm -hmm. uh, woman, and she she did a movie which I really loved a couple years ago, which was a Sundance movie called Three Minutes of Lengthening. Okay. And it was a documentary about three minutes of found footage. They found three minutes from a, a Jewish town in Poland right. that was wiped out in the Holocaust. So, so she made a movie called Three Minutes of Lengthening, which was right. one of the most fascinating documentaries I've seen. And it's basically where um, she she found three minutes from from this little town in Poland, three minutes from uh, of, of Super Eight footage, basically. Um, that um was a little remnant of a lost world a pre-holocaust world right of a jewish little town and they went back and they there's no you see nothing else in the entire 90 minute film except for frames of that enhanced frame zoomed in and they went and they found all of the people um that they could that were still alive that are relatives and stuff like that and they actually found some of the little kids that right. were in the film so it's a real sense of like it's 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 uh, it's lament in the sense that it's kind of um, mourning this lost world and trying to bring in some hope of, you know, look, here's some people who survived it and they're still around. So she and Steve McQueen now, Steve McQueen, the, the British director, right. did um, a four hour documentary on Amsterdam and it's called Occupied City. And it's basically goes to every place that they can find street by street in Amsterdam where a Jewish family lived mm -hmm. that was deported. And now who lives there now? So right. there's this kind of sense of layering, you know, and, and Steve McQueen had a very interesting, he's talking about occupation. And he said, you know, even I was aware that I, I rented a, a, an apartment in Amsterdam and I'm now occupying that apartment and who lived there before me. So right now there's a lot of people that are talking about, you know, displacement gentrification occupation colonialism all that big thing about that's that's in discussion as well right now mm -hmm. in terms of here i am in this place but am i displacing someone else that's part of the i know that that delves into the into the woke world a little bit where you know the occupiers are bad and the indigenous are good that very black and white thing right. but there is a more complex compl uh, conversation going on i think which has to do with the younger generation going, they, they've taught, they were taught right. that they, if they have anything, it was stolen and they're on, they're, 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 um, they've stolen the land that they live on or whatever. Right, right, right. And, but there's still that sense of, well, then who am I then? You know, yeah, yeah. if I don't even deserve to be here, you know, so it's another layer of anxiety that people are trying yeah. to, well, process I, through. I was part of the first generation that got a lot of that. Uh, you know, I had to read Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. I read uh, books about the civil rights movement. I learned about, you know, Jim Crow era and all of these things. And my own thought was like, OK, well, I'm not going to be like those people. Yeah. But I didn't question the fact that that uh, America, for all of its faults, uh, or Western civilization for all of its faults was in some way always the villain. I mean, it was just like, okay, well, we live in a time when different people are struggling for power and different people get a hold of, you know, get near the throne or get on the throne for a while and then they get off, which is why I never had a, a Trump meltdown because I thought like, okay, he's not, he'll, he'll be here for a while and then he'll get off, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, whereas other people I know were like, ah, this is the end of the universe, <laughs> you know, but, and, and I know people on the right who feel that way, probably about Joe Biden, you know, and I just go, I can't, you know, this will come and this will go. Meanwhile, I've got to do what I am responsible for, which requires a lot of cultural investigation. I'm thinking about how to, you know, what kind of culture should we have in a world where so much is abstracted onto our, you know, uh, smartphones and things like that, whereas so much of our world has been digitized and put into a box, which is one of the reasons why puppetry is really important to me, because I because that, along with, say, dance, uh, I, uh, when I watch that, I say, well, 
you really can't put those things into digital form in the same way. So uh, you can watch them in, in a video, but it's just uh, bears no relationship to being in the presence of a puppet or a dancer. You know, it's just yeah. a very different kind of thing. And I think that, I mean, what I'm uh, hoping for and what I talk about on my channel quite a bit is how do we get a sense of the real back into our culture? You know, and people will say, well, you're just trying to go back to the past. I said, no, I'm not. I'm trying to get to the future because, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, I have a lecture that I gave on on texture. And as I was I was researching this, part of this came out of my my research on puppetry and stuff. And I thought I was in this French uh, puppet institute and, and I was looking and I said, oh, let me look up and see if they have any books on puppets and texture. And there were none. And I thought like, okay, well, let me look a little broader into the wider world and see if there are any good books on texture. And I said, and there aren't any except for a couple fabric books and some people trying to reproduce texture on in digital format. And I said, this is really weird. And I said, we don't think about texture at all anymore. Meanwhile, we're building the most featureless structures to live in. You know, yeah. and that's all about texture, you know, so smooth yeah. being in some sense, the opposite of texture. And, mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, so I better start digging into this. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was my thought rather than sit there and call, Oh, what was me? And then, and then I had recently another kind of, uh, Hey, whatever happened to ornamentation? You that's know? what I was just going to say. Yeah. 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 And, and they're related. Uh, you know, uh, how does it feel to live in a room that has, you know, ornaments, ornamentation built into it, and it's got actual wood, you see, it's mm -hmm. like these things, and, and which then led me into looking more at architecture, and some of the, so much of uh, the theories about these things came from architecture, um, but, you know, and also delineating the difference between the postmodern era and the modernist era, but where are we now? I think we're, we're right now at the point where the, the postmodern era is falling off, but we can't name where we are. I think as of 2020, it was like, okay, postmodernism, see ya. You know, it's just like, I don't know what you were doing, but uh, where are we? What, what do we call this? But at the yeah. same time, I had a group, I invited uh, some people on my channel to come here. I got six takers, six guys between the ages of 20. And, uh, there was a guy who was about 38, 39. And so uh, I showed them Georgian culture, which totally blew their mind and introduced them to Georgians, um, then went up into the mountains and we looked at things there and spent some time talking and, and uh, doing that. And that was quite interesting because uh, I could tell, for instance, Georgian culture still has a sense, there is a sense of unity to it. Although if you look at what the younger artists are doing, they're often influenced by the West and they think somehow that's cool. Uh, mm -hmm. And and what I try to tell when I meet young George, I go like, no, dang, <laughs> you know, you should keep doing what you're doing and just keep extending it further and further into different areas. Just just simply keep being Georgian, because mm -hmm. nobody wants to see. Uh, no one's coming here to look at a new uh, Dubai style building. They're going to yeah. come here to look at your old streets. They're going to come here to look at your balconies overgrown with grapevines. They're going to come here and look at your, even the art during the Soviet times is still filled with these Georgian uh, influences. And so that's what they're going to look at. They're not going mm -hmm. to come here to look at, you know, this, this new bridge they built, which, you know, it's like, okay, so it's new and shiny, big deal, you know, and, mm -hmm. but, but Georgia still has enough of its soul that, that it's like that. And so the people I had were coming, I had one guy from Israel I had uh, uh, someone from Brooklyn, someone from Mississippi. I told him, Luke, you are by far the most exotic person here in Georgia right now because no one has ever met anyone from Mississippi. <laughs> you know, I mean, not someone who was just like before he came here was working in a Walmart, you know, and then came here and then went back. <laughs> um, and then we had a uh, Latvian, Netherlands, uh, Swiss guy, uh, you know, and um, and they were all uniformly very impressed by the culture here. And more interestingly, I had an evening where I had some of my Georgian friends come over and uh, had them, and they just asked questions. And they are all really fascinated. And then at a certain point, uh, I 
we kind of opened it up from individual discussions to a larger discussion. And the Georgians all were like, we, we want to go to America, to the West. And all the, the other people were going like, no, <laughs> don't you understand what you have here? You know, yeah. they all kind of didn't because they're seduced by all this shiny imagery that we sent out into the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that 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 in the in the not too distant future, this looking for the real, you know, it's just like, you know, even your experience of watching Godzilla, it's a real Godzilla. Movie. It's not mm -hmm. a it's not a blockbuster version. It's not a postmodern version, you know, like the Roland Emmerich one from the late 90s was like. Yeah, we don't want to do the straight Godzilla. We're going to make him look like a big dinosaur. So, but it's going to be so big and but it's just yeah. it's empty, you know. Whereas yeah. the, the it sounds like this Godzilla minus 1 is the real thing. Yeah. Yeah. And and it it deals with um duty, you know. Yeah. Uh, it deals with um, you know, the main character is it it's going back to that Japanese question of the kamikaze pilot, the one that self-sacrifices for the good of the collective. Right. And, you know, and, and, so, and so it's like, man, I have never seen a movie in recent times that, that deals with heroism or, you know, duty to, to, to your country, right. or loyalty to something larger than you rather than just to yourself, you know? So I think, yeah, and, I think. And it's very right. Japanese. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. I think the thing is actually the most universal things come out of the most particular, so that mm -hmm. it you know and the problem is is our media has been for years trying to make everything universal so this will sell in China and so that will you know we can have this franchise do everything you know whether it's a food franchise or a movie franchise it's all you know we cut off the rough parts and don't make yeah. it seem too particular. I think one of the reasons comedy has been in such trouble is because comedy is very particular to a place. And mm -hmm. I think all those, for instance, in America, for ages, we were just making these high school, uh, teen high school comedies, for instance, as one species. But when you think about it, actually, those are extremely American, you know, because other mm -hmm. schools in other parts of the world don't, aren't actually organized the way ours are. We think they are. We think it's universal. But that's also what makes them so interesting. So I, can, I, as American, can go watch these high school movies. And even though they don't actually represent the times, they do in another way represent our thoughts to ourselves about the times. Whereas mm -hmm. they that, that whole thing's pretty much dried up because uh, they don't connect around the world. You know, what is an Islamic person going to think about American pie? You know, it's just like... <laughs> Probably, hopefully, not much, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was one movie called Showing Up, which was mm -hmm. another Sundance movie that was about a woman who's a sculptor, and she's wondering again, you know, what what are these sculptures? I'm 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 compelled to make these sculptures. What do they mean? And everyone thought, well, that's a boring movie. It's a it's just a mumblecore movie. It's an independent yeah. movie. But there's a little subplot in it where she finds a wounded bird. And she nurses the wounded bird back to life. And so there's a sense of like, that's what people are trying to do. Find, right. the, nurse this wounded bird back to life. Yeah. And when the bird is healthy again, her sculptures will have meaning in some sense like that. You know, like her art will have meaning when she nurses the bird back to life. That's what people are doing. It's like they're they're looking at this thing that's kind of dead and they're going, we got to, we got to find life again. We got to, you know, it, it's the, it's the evening of, Whenever you're in the evening period of a culture, you have to survive the night without yeah. losing your. Yeah. You got to go into the dream world. This is, you know, the the um, more. If you think of the morning as that's when you find your direction and your identity. The afternoon is when you find when you do all your work, and then the evening is either you celebrate the work that you did, or if you didn't do much, that much work, then you drink and then you fall asleep and you dream. Right. right. You know. And then you have to wait for the dawn of the next day, which is the resetting of the direction uh, that you're supposed to go in, the yeah. resetting. of. That. So that's why the prophets are always thinking, looking for the new Jerusalem, the next day, the next dawn, well, hopefully it will come up, you know. That's the reason I moved from, I've been studying music history for a long time. 
and trying to understand. One of my big questions was always, why did music change so much in the 20th century? Without going into it, I found the answer to that question. And once I did, I saw what the future of music was going to be. And I could kind of see what happened at the end of the 90s to the present. Uh, uh, very clearly in about 1995, I said, okay, we're at the end of this story. And uh, so what's the next story? W what, you know, music and movies were the two big things of the uh, two biggest arts, I think, most important arts of the 20th century. I mean, obviously there were more, but... But those are the two that, that were really iconic. And I said, so what will be the art of the 21st century? All of this other stuff now is found on in digital media. You know, you can watch Lawrence of Arabia on a smartphone. You know, it's like, what is the point of that? Um, so, uh, you know, you can listen to any music you want. It's just in your head and you can just do this and you get your Spotify playlist or whatever. But I realized... Um, around the beginning of near the end, actually right before I was leaving New York City to move to Alaska in 1996, I said I started getting an inkling about puppetry and I said, oh, there's something here and I saw the textures I saw these these this thing that couldn't be put into a digital box very easily and uh, so I said okay, that's something and the more I've, uh, I've studied it, the more I said, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah, puppetry is, is hmm. very much it'll take a little bit longer but it the more people seek for the real the more they will find the arts that reflect a world you can touch and feel and hmm. so that's why i think i think eventually painting will come back in in a different way than we've seen it it will no longer be part of the the entire uh modern postmodern uh the cycle that began in the renaissance it'll be something else and uh, music, classical music, has in many ways has kind of gone through some of these things earlier, but it doesn't have a large audience. Uh, most younger people don't know much about it at all. But when I look at the Polish composers of the last part of the 20th century, early aughts, I say, yeah, they got it. They understood that the the road out of modernism and postmodernism. But unfortunately, and Poland still has a very good musical, classical music uh, uh, education uh, scene. Uh, but I think we are in a place where it's it's kind of, we're in this addictive cycle with the media, with social media, with phones and all of this stuff. And I think, and it's and it's really having an effect on on so much else. But it's interesting to me, and I, I came here and, you know, what happened here was the Soviet Union ended, then they went through a decade or so of a couple of civil wars here, and then uh, they get, went into grinding poverty and political uncertainty, and then they kind of came out of it in 2004, started inviting investment and such. So Western culture starts coming in in 2004, but then they have another war in 2008, five-day war with Russia. Um, and so it's really after that, that they really start to pick up and now they're doing quite well, hmm. but here's the thing in that process, during that period, the Russians took all of their old music delivery systems out as far as music stores. So then people all got the internet and so they stopped paying for everything. So is there a book? Is there a music? Is there a movie? Download. And when I first got here, the first couple of years I was here, there was a system I could use. It was just like, is it on Disney? Oh, there it is. Is it on uh, HBO? There it is. Is it on, uh, you know, Netflix? There it is. You know, uh, they didn't have much old stuff, but, you know, they had almost everything from, we'll say, 1995 onward. And yeah. so, so that was... Uh, but what I would do is, you know, you might notice I have some books here. I'm trying to bring my real library here. But these are books I've picked up since I've been here. And I would show them. And, and suddenly, like some of my friends would start holding these books. And I said, oh, these are really great. I said, yeah, those are called books. <laughs> <laughs> and they have stuff that isn't online. And yeah. 
they they you, we treat them very differently. Books, I think, are going to make a comeback, uh, and I see signs of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Vinyl records came back, which is very interesting, and yeah. and uh, actually CDs are quite are selling quite well. I mean, mm -hmm. multi multi millions of copies every year still, and they all thought yeah. it would die out. And like I said, Taylor Swift is responsible for every. I mean, she's been doing this re-recording of Taylor's versions of her uh, albums to get the uh, the the music rights back. But what's interesting is, so she'll put them out in a special edition in on vinyl, and the vinyl is you know more much more expensive than when we were young. Uh, but the kids are <laughs> there's a great story. She put out one I think uh, in three. Uh, three albums uh, in one uh, package, three discs. And I guess two of them were in 45 RPM, which if you know anything about uh, high fidelity sound, a 45 RPM 12 inch record is the best. It wipes out everything else for sound fidelity. And mm -hmm. so someone though was writing uh, a review of it and said, I don't know why Taylor started singing like an, uh, an old man now, but I still like her music. Because <laughs> they bought a turntable because of yeah. her, but they didn't know anything yeah. about turntable speeds. Yeah. So yeah. I find that kind of well, turn. That's probably, you know, I think you the idea of something physical and the connection to the person, that's this whole, that's the antidote to the digital world, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and it's so much so that, uh, you know, I was looking around and I saw all the confetti on the ground in the stadium. And I saw on eBay that people were selling the confetti on eBay. Yeah, this is yeah. the confetti from the Taylor. And I was like, man, I could be rich. I could take all this confetti. Right. Taylor Swift <laughs> you know? confetti. Because it's it's like, yeah, but, they, they but the whole the physical connection. I think yeah. what makes Taylor Swift such a unique phenomena is that the girls aren't just going there to a big concert. And it's mm -hmm. largely girls, obviously, but there's others, but still, they aren't just yeah. going there to a big concert. They're going there because it's the only place in their lives where they connect to other human beings physically. Yes. And there's, mm -hmm. a, I've been watching some videos. Uh, there was one where there was a girl who's, uh, whose father is telling her to open up this uh, Christmas present. And it's a big box. Like, you know, I, bigger than my head, but like this. And um, she's opening it. And she's just the the typical bored 15-year-old opening up a box. And then she opens it up. And there's another box inside. And it's also gift wrapped. It's Christmas. And she's going through it. And then there's a bo another box wrapped in duct tape. And she's like, oh, gosh. And then, then there's another box that's gift wrapped. She goes down six layers and finally comes to an envelope, opens it up. Now, all this time, she's making a commentary about like, uh, yeah, you know, just kind of like, okay, whatever. I got to open another box. Just totally boring, bored kid talk. And yeah. she gets to the last one and it's Taylor Swift tickets. Mm. And her mm. whole face changes. Yeah. And suddenly she just breaks into tears. That this is the most important thing in her life. And I was looking at that going like, Wow. That's that's an amazing effect. What does that effect mean? Well, that's why I'm writing these these essays, trying to work it out because I don't think it's a simple black and white kind of uh, effect. Yeah. I think we have a generation hungry for physical connection, hungry to feel uh, like they connect to something. Yeah. Know? Well, and, it's 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 day seven. This is what I think. You mentioned or ornamentation, so you, you so. What happens on day seven, right? What what happens on day seven is celebration, feast, ornamentation, right? That's worship. Mm -hmm. Okay. When I was in that SoFi Stadium with that many people, I said, that's what it is. Everyone was decked out in their Taylor Swift outfits. That's the ornamentation. She right. changed her dress every single song almost. Right. All of these different cut styles of the guitars and dancing and this and that. So it's all excess ornamentation celebration, you right. know? Now, you know, most, I don't want to say anything controversial, but most Protestant churches give you a tiny little bread like that and a little tiny piece of wine. And they say, here's the feast, you know? And it's also in a building that celebrate is- Celebrate the Lord's Supper. Yes. 
So you're in a building that looks like a bank and you got this little utility thing. And that's from day six. Day six is the day of utility and work during the week where you have glass buildings with no ornamentation and smooth surfaces like you're talking about texture. But on day seven, when I go to Orvieto, Italy, where I sometimes where I studied abroad and I look at the facade on the Duomo there and I see just an explosion of art, you know, and ornamentation and excess that's what day seven is. And that's what we're missing. I mm -hmm. think what we're missing in our culture. That's why when Taylor Swift goes here, here's a little bit of it. Right. They just flood. They flood yeah. into it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. She's definitely uh, hitting a need, maybe too strongly. Maybe, maybe there's too much of a hive mind there, but, but that should tell those of us who aren't in the hive mind to look at that and try to get the best ideas we can from it mm -hmm. and to to think about that um yeah i i just think there are possibilities in this time of of yeah chaos and change um yeah. one of the things about this particular time which is say i mean i grew up all through the cold war and all through the cold war you kind of knew what was happening as long as russia was kind of like not threatening to bomb anybody and we weren't too loud we were like okay we're in the stalemate thing and oh isn't it terrible about the gulags and stuff like that and uh then we got out of that and and it's interesting how we squandered the 90s <laughs> the 90s were a time when there were possibilities but uh, you know, the, the Cold War was over, but we were already in the middle of our new uh, culture war by that time. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't yeah. hardly, okay, that's over, right? Well, we're already doing this. I don't like them. You know, I don't like the mm -hmm. people who aren't, don't think like me. And then uh, then we entered the post 9-11 world, which there was a lot of suspicion, a lot of uh, surveillance, a lot of arming. And then we entered this other weird world that we were in for the last 10, 15 years, or 10 years, this particularly. And it had a lot more of this weird division happening uh, and more extreme ideas. And, and then came the pandemic. And it was like, these things were all building up. And I spent a lot of time on my channel dealing with this stuff. But suddenly, the, the, the good thing about the pandemic is it just stopped everything. Now, not everything that came out of that was good, but but it just stopped everything. And uh, it was the end of a cycle. Exactly. It, it, it exactly. was a death. It was the end of a certain cycle. Right. Yeah. And and that's why I think. And since then, then we had, you know, uh, Russia invades Ukraine. Then we had, you know, what's going on in Israel right now and Palestine. We've also had uh, economic. Nobody knows exactly what's going on with the economics and stuff. Uh, and just a lot of of people not knowing where they are. And and we're in this place during my life. You always kind of knew where you were. Yeah. Okay. We're in this post 9-11 world now. And then they finally caught Obama, uh, Obama Osama bin Laden. And <laughs> A Freudian slip there, uh, <laughs> and and uh, but even during the Trump years, you kind of knew. Okay, these people really hate Trump, and these people are more behind him, and there was a, a certain sense about it. But now it's like I think Leonard Cohen said it best: uh, things are going to slide, slide in all directions. Yeah, you know? and yeah, and that's where we are. We are in yes. this weird zone where everything is fluid. I wouldn't place bets on anything right now. But mm -hmm. I would attempt things now. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's always the period. That's the period of time when you need direction. That's what everyone's looking for. And yeah. the biggest temptation when everyone is directionless, looking for direction, is the idol. That's that's the that's the thing that, that, that you know. So it's going to be. It seems to me between right direction and let's say idolatry those right. are the good those are the two competing right. um in other periods of time it might be between two kings two 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 uh dynasties of power maybe right. that would be more the cool that's that's a kingly you might say a kingly earthly conflict whereas when when uh when everything's wiped out and you have a reset which happened with COVID, it's like a night you're in the dream world you're waking up to a new dawn right okay now the question is are you going to follow the star are you going to follow the North Star or are you going to follow another one? And right. that's where that's what I see happening. Right. 
Right. Yeah, which uh, gives me mm, tempered hope that that new things can happen. Uh, also, you know, tempered concern that bad things can happen. Yeah. But well, and my my advice is: look, you, what your job is right now is to find the north star. Yeah, that's yeah. your job. Everyone's direct. So that's what you should be focusing on. Right. Find the North Star. Yeah. And that's, uh, well, in a sense, I felt like I found it a while ago. So now what I'm doing is trying to set it up and apply things. And um, because I've been working on this, I, I kind of suspected this time was coming a long time ago. So when I got back from Labrie in 1979, I was like, okay, I got to get to work. And and so all these things have happened. I've just had my horse blinders out going like, no, keep going. You know, like the world's going to fall apart. Doesn't matter. Just keep going. Because I always saw the need for a different approach to culture that includes the old, but mm -hmm. also is open to whatever the new will be. So yeah. uh, I, I find things now and then I go like, oh, that's an interesting thing. What is that development? You know, what is in architecture? There's a thing called biophilic design. I said, that's got some possibilities. There's a bit of ornamentation there. And they're also using the the actual plants to provide texture. I say, that's an interesting yeah. Or I look at, uh, uh, you know, in distribution systems with music, uh, with films right now. And I go like, okay, so if Sound of Freedom and Taylor Swift can kind of just kind of come in here mm -hmm. and have an impact outside of the standard model, what does that say about the model that's being developed? That's an interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. If for, as far as architecture, I want to recommend one book, which you, you would love if you can find it. It's called Yes is More, and it's by Bjark Ingels from okay. Sweden. And he does exactly the kind of design that you're talking about. Right. It's right. a graphic novel as an architecture book. Okay. Yes it's is made. More. Yes is more. Yeah, okay. you'll love it. I have this it. recording so I can find this again. <laughs> yeah. So, well, it's getting, uh, I'm I'm enjoying the conversation, but it is getting towards midnight here. And uh, yes, we, we'll, and I finished my whole pot of coffee. So I, yeah. I think that's, 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 a, good, that's a sign. Yeah, my, my glass <laughs> is empty too. So. <laughs> so. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and there's a few little glitches here, but I can edit them quickly. So I'm not yeah. worried about that. And, uh, I appreciate talking with you. We will do it again. And like Absolutely. I said, I'll send you an email, uh, let you know when this will be airing, uh, either the 27th or the 28th, depending. And, yeah. uh, yeah. I'm, and I'm, one of these days I'll make it out there. One of you these should, days. You should. When the stars align, I'll make Well, you it know up. what I'm doing is I, I'm already starting to work on a puppet festival here for next October. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to be an international puppet festival, but not huge. Just it's more about the art of puppetry than it is about awards or, you know, big, a big deal. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. more I just want a few people here that I've met along my path and um uh, plus the Georgian puppeteers and other local people and put it all together. And I've got the perfect place for it. So I'm going to do yeah. that. So meanwhile, yeah. I, I, I wish you well in the uncertain yeah. world of uh, Los Angeles film business right now, uh, the Southern yeah. California film world. Yeah. And I hope you're, you can get your library out there. I hope you, I hope that all. That, yeah. That comes I got to keep working on it. So yeah. But uh for anyone watching this, the links are below, PayPal and GoFundMe, either way. So, okay, Justin, have a good uh, All right. day, and I will have a good night's sleep. And, okay. Uh, as the Georgians say, draw a beat, which simply is a word right. meaning temporarily, but it also implies we'll just be gone from each other a little while, then we'll meet again. Yeah. Okay. Draw Take a beat. <laughs> Take care. Well, thanks to Justin Wells for joining us here on The Anadromist for another Anadromist Dialogue. Uh, lots of fascinating stuff there that we talked about, and I gave me food for thought, which I always enjoy when these things give me food for thought. And uh, just a reminder, I am still trying to raise money to get my stuff, my, rescue my library from Alaska. So be generous, uh, go down, use the links for PayPal or GoFundMe.
And from Tbilisi, Georgia, this is Byrne saying, Draw a beat, we will meet again. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments. 